But we begin with issue number one and our leadoff hitter back from his break. Joe, Joey Torts for ready. Joe. Well, I'm going to apologize to Larry Schultz up, up front here because I know he was uh, geared up for this topic. But, Larry, I did post before you, so I think in, in all fairness, I'm going to run with it. I was prepared uh, 100% for this. Yes, go okay. ahead. <laughs> I'm psyched. Well, uh, look, uh, the, the Fox News case involving Dominion voting, and as we know, Dominion voting is suing Fox News to the tune of probably billions because of the broadcasting that took place and the allegations against Dominion voting specifically that their voting machines were corrupt and that they, they corrupted the election in 2020. I find this interesting, Rob, for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is we're, we're on a media outlet right here. Uh, so in reacting to the evidence and testimony under oath from Fox News owners and executives that they knew what they were broadcasting was unadulterated BS, uh, and they testified to that. I'm wondering what our reaction to this should be as consumers of news. I, I find it personally highly insulting that these folks behind the scenes would basically say, yeah, we know we're feeding a bunch of crap out there, but so what? You know, that's what our viewers want to hear and, and uh, what want to see. Uh, now, I, I don't want this to devolve into, well, everybody does it, so it's okay, because I, I think underlying all this, we have to agree, it's not okay. So what should we demand of our news outlets? Where do we go for perhaps less biased and less corrupt news? And, and, and how do we... Uh, as a society, deal with the fact that the major news outlet, the most popular news outlet in the country, was feeding us a line of BS and admitted to it, uh, and it did it because it was for the almighty dollar. How do we respond to this, and, and, and what as a society should we demand of our news outlets? All right, let me first uh, start with uh, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, Joe, I, this is uh, interesting in a lot of uh, various dimensions. One is how Dominion got access to thousands and thousands and thousands of emails, and some of which were uh, uh, just between two parties, such as uh, 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 Ingram and Tucker Carlson. And uh, they... Uh, uh, so how do they how do they gain the access to it? But the the access the emails are damaging, and uh, Dominion is sitting on a uh, uh, treasure cove right now as far as trying to I think uh, uh, get retribution from uh, from Fox News. The other thing of interest is Murdoch himself. Uh, he literally uh, is throwing. Fox and the Fox employees under the bus, uh, but for what purpose? He's he's not clear himself. He's going to be uh, uh, he's going to be carrying a heavy part of the responsibility. But yet it looks like he's trying very hard to distance himself and throw everybody else under the bus. So uh, your point's well uh, is well taken. I'm going to be curious to see how we as society. Uh, I don't think anything's going to change. I think we're going to accept the news media. Uh, that uh, that we are partial to, uh, whether it's on the conservative side or the liberal side, we're going to accept the information they provide to us. Uh, so I don't think that's going to change. But I think what will be interesting to follow is one uh, the the results of all these emails and also Murdoch and his relationship with his employees. Chris Anders. We well, you know throughout our history, whether you go back to uh, 1773 in the Boston uh, Massacre, all up through the Remember the Maine, when you had the uh, uh, Spanish-American War, we've had what you know a relationship with what we call the yellow press. Okay, um, it's always been there. Uh, it's proof that the pen sometimes is mightier than the sword. Okay, um, coming off the Ron Paul campaign of 2012, I mean Fox News lied constantly about us. We had a rally with about 20,000 people down uh, at the University of Maryland, and Fox News said there were a couple hundred people there, right? Um, they wouldn't even show uh, Ron on the leaderboard when he came in second place in Iowa, 
right? It's, um, you know, we, we've had this with the media. I, I just, it stuns me that people don't realize that it is more of an entertainment media. They're out there after the dollar. And, you know, you can't rely on any one source, whether it's CNN, MSNBC, uh, or any place else. A lot of times, if I want to find out uh, what's actually happening in the world, I'll, I'll read The Guardian. You know, because they tend to have a lot of good information. They broke the Snowden case, so um, and a lot of the international affairs information. But you know, it, it just is what it is, and I, you know, you can't uh, violate the First Amendment and come back. But people are going to pay civilly for the lies that they have uh, put out there. Larry Schultz. Yeah, I wanted to speak uh, directly to Bill. I'm I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that they got those emails through the discovery process by sending. Uh, uh, letters to by sending requests to the other side and saying, uh, Tucker Carlson, let's see all your emails uh, from certain dates uh, touching on certain subjects. And unless they're going to flat out violate the rules of civil procedure, they got to give that stuff up. And I, I can't imagine, but what the people at even at Dominion voting systems thought oh my gosh when they saw those <laughs> things they thought this is uh you know the mother load um and once you have tucker carlson casting doubt on the very story that he told the country that same night later you know you're to a point where okay this is um, a pre-programmed lie and we can't say that nobody believed it because there's an awful lot of people who believed it. Um, some of them showed up uh, at the Capitol uh, on January 6th. And so it is a, a danger. I do have faith in our civil justice system. And when the number on the verdict form for uh, Fox News has a B at the beginning of its pronunciation, and then there's punitive damages added onto it to the point where Fox uh could find itself trying to seek bankruptcy protection or some other legal thing to save its existence then maybe we will see uh something uh right this isn't putting people in jail this is saying you lied to us you did it in a very serious situation that uh, threatened uh the peaceful transfer of power and we are therefore uh going to take all your money <laughs> so I could I could see a very big verdict. Dominion Voting Systems might become one of the biggest corporations in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Carl. Well, <clears throat> let me say there's there's Fox News and there's Tucker Carlson. Um, for a long time, almost not very shortly after he started that program, I stopped watching Fox because he was clearly uh, uh, distrustful over the top. And I looked for a ball game to watch at 8, at eight o'clock, uh, and I turned <laughs> off Fox. But, but, and and I, I think Murdoch is pushing, you know, is really you know, throwing, throwing them in the dump because he wants to uh, – he, he, he's very concerned that Trump's going to, you know – destroy the Republican Party or the Republican chance to regain the White House, and he wants to undo all the damage that I totally agree Tucker Carlson did to the, the stolen election BS. And and so uh, uh, it, there's there's two different things, and I, I have, still have a lot of confidence in Fox News until 8 o'clock. You know, Tucker Carlson's the one being singled out here, but he's by no means the only one. You're exactly right, yeah. Well, the, uh, tell me the others. Well, Ingram's another one. Well, uh, well. yeah, and also uh, Hannity. Uh, Hannity, yeah. Hannity. So, so mo a lot Tom of them. Hannity, but yeah. but Mike's point's well taken. All of them are after the the eight o'clock. Yes, that's, that, that's, that's, that's right. To. That's right. You know, I, that's Fox. It's 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 not watchable. It's not legitimate after eight o'clock. Period. And, and this I want, confirms it. Fox and Friends. Uh, <clears throat> Has has not been mentioned in this, but that's kind of down their their interest. I don't. Do, that's they the get morning involved. Show. That's the morning show. Yeah, Joe, uh, Rob, I I think to, to sum this up because I, let's not forget the station is called Fox News. 
And I understand Mike's point, and it's a valid one. After 8 o'clock, it does get a little Looney Tunes. But, I mean, they're still under the umbrella of Fox News. So I think that needs to uh, change a little bit. But uh, I'll tell you, Rob, the way to sum this up, I heard a brilliant attorney addressing one day the problem that exists in our society and the hatred we have for each other across the political divide. And she described... Uh, looking at the ground and seeing black ants and red ants scurrying around, doing their thing, you know, bumping into each other, but always tending to their own business. If you pick up those ants, both the black and the red ones, and you put them in a jar and you shake that jar vigorously, those black ants and red ants will begin to fight to the death. And I I think in society, we have to focus less on the fact that there are black ants and red ants. And we got to focus more on who are these people shaking the jar? And in this case, I think Fox News uh, and that evening lineup was guilty of shaking the jar, uh, which culminated in a a violent uprising in in, uh, D.C. where they were trying to hunt down our vice president. And I hope there's a lesson learned here in this civil case, as Larry uh, uh, correctly points out. There's going to be money that likely changes hands. I hope it's a large sum because sometimes to speak to corporations and to get them to wise up, you have to hit them in the pocketbook hard. And I'm thinking that a jury, if the jury ever gets this case eventually, is going to hit Fox News hard because defamation is going to be proven here uh, under the New York Times versus Sullivan standard. And I think a corporation is going to pay the price for that. And I think that's going to be a message, hopefully, to all the corporations out there, whether it's CNN or, or elsewhere, that journalistic integrity is something that this country has banked on for centuries. And I'm hoping that we can get back to some level of that in terms of how we receive our news. In regards to the Fox TV ratings, th- those who watch Fox News, the Fox News channel, does this affect the average viewer? This will will they look at that and say, maybe I shouldn't believe everything that I hear? And this doesn't apply strictly to Fox. E- each political party has their own TV wing that spews forth what their what their uh, people want to hear. Uh, this is just the one right now that's being examined in Fox. Does it affect that viewer? Does that viewer go, you know what? Maybe they're not telling me the truth, or does that viewer say? They just went after them because they don't agree with what these folks are saying. I, I think that most people will make the distinction. I mean, I, I, I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the Martinsburg Journal. Uh, I, I watch uh, 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 CNBC financial news in the morning, and and so and I think a lot of people, you know, aren't locked into a the word Fox. The, the, and, and and I think most people who have any judgment make the same distinction I've made. I I would disagree a little bit with Mike. Not the first time, Mike, and won't be the last time either. But but I think a lot of the uh, the the hardcore Trump supporters have already left Fox News. Uh, so the the group that's uh, still with Fox News, I think, will be somewhat shaken by this information. Chris, I don't. I don't think it's going to change. I think people kind of have, have pigeonholed themselves into either an MSNBC or a CNN person or a Fox News person. But I think what we're looking at is a symptom of a bigger problem, and that we've consolidated all this power into government, which was never meant to be. And Bastiat wrote about that in the 1840s when he wrote the law, and he said if you try to get the government to control every aspect of your life, there'll be nonstop fighting. And of course, when there's nonstop fighting, there's nonstop money, there's everything else, and it's a symptom of a bigger problem that our government is just way too big. Oh, I, I, let me. I forgot to when I was listing my media sources, yes. I, I left out the Charleston Gazette. No thine enemy. <laughs> no thine enemy. I have, I have a daily subscription to it. You know, I, I have I have to wonder in regards to your point, Mike, that that people will look at it in a different way now. And I, I kind of go back to uh, Bill Clinton, and I remember when the uh, news broke about the Monica Lewinsky affair, and I can remember my sister-in-law, a fervent Bill Clinton fan and supporter 
saying to me, that's just Republicans making more stuff up. And this is an educated, intelligent person. OK, so when I when I hear you saying that, I you maybe think maybe people will look at it in a different light. I don't know. I, I think you believe what you believe. And if you believe it strongly enough, anyone who chips away at it becomes someone who's making stuff up about what you believe in. Well, I, I think there's as, as many bad lies on MSNBC and mm-hmm. CNN as, as, as this stuff you're talking about here. So I'm just cynical. I mean, that's, that's the way you deal with it, and you measure and you, you tap into the other side to, you know, to get a balance. But, but you, you know, you, you just, you, you're inherently cynical about everything, and you think, does that make sense, or is somebody making it up? Larry? The, any, anybody from any part of the spectrum uh, who is libeled or slandered by a news outlet uh, has the same freedom as Dominion voting systems. Mm-hmm. The imbalance that we're seeing today is that freedom is being laid on the back of Fox News and not on the back of MSNBC and CNN. Where's the group of people who were lied to so lied about so thoroughly that it damaged them by MSNBC and CNN? If we're going to say, oh, they're all the same, we better have some evidence of a Dominion voting systems being uh, attempted to be ruined by CNN or MSNBC or any of the other outlets. I don't mean to limit, you know, public television. All of those victims of the lies have the same right to bring a civil suit. I never ran into anybody in corporate media who was afraid to have money. (laughs) <laughs> or against having money, right. even PBS, right? They need money. Now, and and now the, just with them, you get a Darth Vader mug if yeah. you have enough. The, the victim is, uh, we're just thinking about Dominion, but would Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani also be considered the victim? Because some of the emails that have come out, a lot of disparaging things were said about both of them. Well, Truth is an absolute defense, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I don't know what that's yeah. disparaging yeah. things yeah. are. You, you know, Sidney Powell, uh, Tucker Carlson said, I caught her in a lie. Yeah. And then, of course, like the next it, night, he's got her on his show. Well, they, they, uh, but, but uh, recognize that in terms of the, the legal system, there's a difference between a absolute lie f- about f- true facts that that injures you and a, and a just a skewed opinion. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, yeah. that's a big difference that you have to recognize yes and it's a difference that's in this dominion voting oh yeah yeah to the the nth degree yeah Mm -hmm. they're they're talking about a fact exactly you know and and that's why that's that's exactly right you stole the votes or you you (laughs) rigged the and and jeff haddix and and your your comment larry about uh msnbc or whatever jeff haddix said rachel maddow is just as incendiary but didn't have the relationships or viewers Okay, but that that's nice, but she didn't defame anybody, or I presume she would have got sued. I, I, I mean, there's plenty of us out there who take these cases. I've tried a defamation case to a verdict. But the other um, side of my point is, just because you haven't been sued doesn't mean you're right. Doesn't mean you aren't saying something that's really harmful to America. Well, you could be, but it's not a lie damaging somebody's reputation. I guess I get that. The difference is, though, we can pretty much count on it in these this day and age. If someone, if you do damage someone by telling lies about them on television, national television, you will likely get sued, or at the very least threatened to be sued. If you damage um, them in a, in, a, in a limited financial sense, if they just lose an election... That that's not a cause of action. But well, right, you right, call right. such a person a loser is actually true. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But in Dominion's case, it practically put them out of business for a while. Yeah, because a lot of the states. Oh yeah, no, that's, 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 right. a that's a that's a tam- tangible damage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Joe, I come back to you for a final thought, but I I caution you. Ever since you brought up the red ants and black ants, I've been itchy as hell over here. So try to stay away from that kind of analogy. I'll, I'll stay away from that analogy. Though. Well, I, you know whether this costs Fox viewers or not, uh, I don't know. But remember what I, what was underlying all this 
was a concern by the talking heads and the executives at Fox that they were losing viewers because they weren't pushing the big lie. Uh, so uh, I, it'll be very interesting to see now that they've been caught, you know, advocating for this bovine scat. It, it'll be it, it'll be interesting to see what their reaction is going to be now because. Uh, will they continue to lose viewers to Newsmax and, and the other outlets, uh, or will they think that uh, perhaps it's time for a little bit more journalistic integrity? Uh, I'll, you know, I'll, it bears watching because we know before they were concerned about losing viewers, and that's why they uh, ran this uh, – this Dominion Post issue up the flagpole. That's a, I hope they don't do it a, a second time. That's a valid point. That kind of, I think started, at least, or at least it kicked into overdrive a bit during the Chris Wallace moderation of the debate, where a lot of Trump supporters thought Chris Wallace was unfair uh, to Donald Trump and showed partiality to Joe Biden. Just, just so we're clear, Joe. It's not Dominion Post. That's the newspaper in Morgantown. It's Dominion Voting System. <laughs> oh, <thank God. laughs> and, 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 the, and the newspaper industry is having enough trouble already with the business model. They don't need a big settlement. Yeah, I don't want to be sued by them. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield, you're on the clock. And we start with issue number two and the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Rob, uh, there's a case in front of the Supreme Court now that, in my view, may be one of the most meaningful cases the Supreme Court has argued or decided in the last several years. And I'm glad we have so many lawyers around the table. And Chris, even though he's not a lawyer, he works the lawyers a great deal. So uh, I, I want to, I'll pick up on why I think it's such an important one in just a second. And that is the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court uh, listening to the student loan forgiveness program. Uh, there's a lot of money Money involved here, 400, $400 billion with 43 million borrowers. And uh, I, the program will be reducing the debt of everybody about $10,000. Some would counsel up to $20,000. Because of these large numbers, there's a lot of emotion with it. A lot of people have their minds made up, should there be a forgiveness or not? And there's good arguments made on both cases. Uh, the uh, for the for On the issue side, uh, there there was uh, the HEROES Act in 2003 that gives some legitimacy to the program. Also, there was an uh, uh, act, act of Congress in 2020 under the Trump administration with COVID that also gives some legitimacy to the program. Uh, there's another uh, so the issue is is debatable uh but to me the real point is the standing uh and this has come to issue the last day or so uh the uh, uh there are f six states that are suing the biden administration uh for the student loan forgiveness none of them can be proven that they will benefit one way or the other missouri has a sector that could be proven, uh, a quasi-government uh, organization that could be a uh, uh, proven that they have a bearing on on the results of the case. They would benefit monetarily, uh, but Missouri are not using this quasi-government as part of their lawsuit. There are a couple of other people suing that would be uh, that they feel they're not getting enough money, uh, so they would they're asking for more money. So the question is for the uh, for the standing, uh, do they, do they, uh, will the Supreme Court extend the definition of standing to include some of these other individuals? As someone said the other day, uh, they're, they're scared of this because there's a presidential overreach, abusing emergency power on one side, the imperial judiciary moving beyond its constitutionally imposed boundaries. Uh, as, uh, as a good friend of mine who's a lawyer described the other day, that we're on a slippery slope. Will the Supreme Court find a way to incorporate these organizations and give them standing so that they will have enough of a majority to, uh, to make a decision which a lot of the public would like to see them make, and that would be to reject the administration's loan forgiveness program. Yeah, so that, and I'm going to add on to yours, Bill, because yeah. yours is kind of a technical yeah. in, in regards to the definition of standing. Uh, I'll add on to that. Uh, please feel free to offer your own personal opinion as to whether or not there should be 
federal student loan forgiveness. Not, and you can also throw in whether you think the, the president has the powers to do that, too. So make it a, a, a bigger, broader answer yeah, if you don't and, mind. And actually, you're right, Rob. To me, there's two, think, uh, two things. Would there... Uh, uh, the what will the Supreme Court do now? But the greater uh, question to me is what are the far reaching ramifications of the Supreme <laughs> Court's decision primarily on the standing aspect? Let's go to Chris Anders first. Okay, um, first of all, uh, it's my personal opinion if you take out a loan, uh, you pay it back. Uh, but we also have to recognize at the same time our, our country is broke. And we are absolutely broke. And if we start forgiving all these loans, um, I mean, the every taxpayer or every citizen of these United States is in debt because of you know political spending, ninety-two thousand dollars each. I don't care if you were born yesterday or you're eighty years old. Um, our country's broke. Uh, these people took out loans; they should pay them back. But at the same time, the federal government should not be involved in student loans. Period because government interference in the free market always creates poverty. If you look at the price of education uh, since the student loan program has come out, it has skyrocketed. It has absolutely gone through the roof. Uh, meanwhile, services the government's not tangled up in or you know, the prices have pretty much stayed the same or gone down if you if just for the inflation rate. I think this is, again, and I keep coming back to this, indicative of the government trying to do too much for too many people. There shouldn't be student loans, and, but however, we're in a position, these people did take out the loans, they signed on the form, they should pay them back, period. Larry Schultz. Yes, there's a provision in the student loan system <clears throat> whereby if you're a public school teacher or involved in some other kinds of public service, uh, once you have worked 10 years in that public service and paid whatever your dictated monthly amount was, all other loans are, all, all the rest of the loan is forgiven. I do not know whether that results from a statutory act of Congress or whether that was an executive order by a president of the United States. I don't see if it was an order by the president of the United States, how they could strike down this order without striking that one down. Um, and you're going to see a lot of pressure. You know, every teacher, every West Virginia teacher who can hear my voice right now probably is counting on that 10 year window uh, to be up. And when it is that the rest of their loans will be forgiven. I don't know if that's a, a statute uh, passed by the Congress or a part of the loan program that was just put in by a president. That'll make a difference. Also on the standing question. Um, for anybody who doesn't know exactly what we're talking about, standing in a Supreme Court case means you are a person who is affected in such a way by this particular law that you have the right to complain about it. It keeps us from having a thing where some guy who isn't affected at all, some guy who never had a student loan, comes in and says, well, wait a minute, um, people shouldn't have to pay this stuff you get a lot better decisions and results if the people involved are directly affected themselves in one way or another. So that that's why the standing rules exist. And, and uh, Bill is right to bring it up because it is an issue they're going to have to, to deal with. Mike Carl. Well, f f first of all, <clears throat> standing is not limited to financial loss. And I'm very confident that the program you talked about is the result of some legislation. Now, it might have been, you know, kind of stretched the meaning of, of legislation, but, <clears throat> but, but this is blatant. You know, what, what, what Biden's trying to do is blatant, and, and it, it absolutely shouldn't be turned on, on the standing. Every American, whether you're a public official or a private citizen, has a right to not have the president of the United States violate the Constitution, which is what he's doing here, uh, to buy votes. And that's the story of this case. Joe Ferretti. Well, the, the, I think the origins of this standing argument that the bill raises, uh, it comes from the fact that there's a group of attorney generals in this country, and, and our own uh, Patrick Morrissey is one of them. I think there's about 31 of them 
who do a lot of suing on behalf of states against the Biden administration on any number of for any number of reasons, uh, climate change proposals and resolutions and laws and uh, you know EPA um, agency directives. Uh, these guys have filed a lot of lawsuits. In fact, Ken Paxton, the attorney general for Texas, described his job as uh, punching in, suing the federal government, and then going home. Uh, and what they've done is they have created this standing issue as a concern at the Supreme Court level because in some instances they've been able to show very clearly that states are impacted by some of these federal regulations much like the EPA issue uh, that the uh, Attorney General Patrick Morrissey raised. But in other cases, it's been thin soup to, to establish standing, to show that there are direct impacts on the states for some of these federal directives and, and executive orders. Uh, and this loan issue is one of those that involves thin soup. Uh, there's some concern that maybe some of these states education loan organizations may not be able to collect the money that they're due and that's going to affect the states individually and that's their argument for standing but it is a significant issue because the supreme court is inclined i believe to try to limit the number of lawsuits that these attorney generals are filing uh, and, and, and clogging up the supreme court with on, on a regular basis and i think that's why that's a, that's a prominent issue in this case i hope uh, like Mike, Mike, Mike Carl raises here, I hope that the Supreme Court will focus on the legalities of this and not have their discussions devolve into whether it's fair or not, because we can go down that rabbit hole in a lot of instances where things are fair or unfair in life. Uh, but there are there's a there's a law that Bill Stubblefield cited, the 2003 Heroes Act. That's what the president was acting under. Is that proper? authority under that statute to do what he's done. That's the legal question, and I hope the Supreme Court will focus clearly on that alone. There, there are, I bet, maybe millions of people who are legitimate beneficiaries of that Veterans Act who are harmed directly that did not go to college themselves, or uh, and they are harmed directly by this absolutely unconstitutional act by the president not only to buy votes directly from the people whose loans are forgiven but to buy votes from the people the liberals who support that all the colleges that are raising their their comp or their tuition by you know huge percentages because of this program well mike let's not forget that while the colleges are certainly to blame uh the, the states have cut funding to public education also. So, uh, and that funding did help to keep tuition rates lower than they are. Uh, so there's been a lot of uh, factors in the equation here as to why college education is so darn expensive and people have to borrow so much money. But, you know, I, I, can, I can argue just as well that, that all of us are hurt by the fact that we take federal money and, and pay farm subsidies, and we're not all farmers. So there's a lot of ways you can argue this and look at this, but I think overall uh, it really comes down to a legal question as to whether that statute in 2003 enables the president to do what he did. It is a legal question that deserves a legal answer. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I think the interesting part of this is going to be how the Supreme Court handles the question of standing. It's a slippery slope and how they're going to get off the slippery slope. So, so there's no doubt that that. that Biden's wrong, but it's just, no, no, just I, a technicality. I, I, I did not say that. Was well, Joe Biden right? So, you know. Uh, by the way, I'm finding uh, a code of federal regulations, which the last I checked is not passed by the Congress, which invented and set up the PLSF or PSLF Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. So I'm I'm looking for the statutory authority. I don't see any, and so. It, there's another slippery slope, if I'm right about this, and that slippery slope is all the teachers who just got a $2,300 raise here are going to be spending uh, $2,400 more every year uh, for their $200 minimum payment. Um, I, I don't think you can do this by standing. I think you got to address the merits. 
And uh, agree. And, and I, right. I tell right. you, you never dismiss something on standing. You you miss the whole merits of the case. And this is a this is a sliver of a discussion of a much bigger bomb that's out there, which is student loan debt. And this is one way of dealing with it. And let's face it, if you've got one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars of student loan debt, getting ten thousand dollars of forgiveness, which you may get a tax bill for anyway, by the way. Uh, so it's really less than ten thousand uh, dollars. Getting ten thousand dollars of forgiveness is it's, it's spitting in the ocean. But the bigger issue here is the student loan debt itself. And as Chris pointed out, this student loan debt. There's a lot of forks in this road, and, and one of which is the federal government's decision to begin backing these student loans 100%. So what did colleges do? Mm-hmm. Jack up the mm-hmm. rate of tuition, room and board, student fees. Everything skyrocketed at a much faster rate than inflation. And then we marketed college to all these kids as the only way you can make it in America is you got to get a college degree. So all these kids went and got college degrees because it was the thing to do, right? We pushed it on them. Parents mm-hmm. pushed it on them. So the kids mm-hmm. just kept, I'm 18. What do I know about debt I might get when I'm 23 years old? Just keep signing. Keep signing. My parents signed it. Now we got a bunch of people who have house payments for a student loan payment and don't have a house to have a house payment for, right? Right. So who, is, it, is it the kid's fault for taking out the loan? Sure. Is it, is it the government's fault for getting involved in this and jacking up the price of tuition? Absolutely. Is it the college's fault for greedily jacking up the price of tuition beyond the pace of inflation for 35 straight years? 100% it is. But here's the hypocrisy of the whole thing. You got people in Washington, D.C., elected officials who took PPE loans and accepted forgiveness for that, who are against this forgiveness. And then you've, it got, is true. you've got the rest of us sitting around. Okay, if, is the issue that we're, we're not paying the loans back, so it's, the, it's, it's, keep, it's depriving the Treasury of money? Okay. You bought a house. What do you deduct when you do your taxes at the end of the year? Mortgage. You deduct your mortgage interest. Why? Because they say you can. Does that not deprive the federal government of tax dollars? Sure does. You get to deduct your, your real estate taxes. You get to deduct your personal property taxes. That's called the long form, right? You're not doing the short form. You're doing the long form. Every deduction you take deprives the federal government of tax dollars. But the, the, the legitimate deductions are based on the idea of net gain and net profit, not some uh, issue of buying votes like this. Well, that's the short-term answer of why Biden's doing it, but it's the greater problem of these student loans. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the government's involved in so many things that's constitutionally prevented from doing so, and nobody stopped them. You know, this is just one of the problems that we have. The government's involved in everything from what light bulb you can have in your house, and I say that a million times, right, to what toilet you can have, to your student loan, everything else. The Constitution was supposed to bind the government and keep them from getting involved. They've created this problem uh, by consolidating all this power in D.C., and, and it's just, you know, when these college kids are graduating with a mortgage, essentially, they're already shackled into the system. We need to go back to a a constitutional government that we don't need an income tax anymore. We don't need all these taxes. It should be the way the founding fathers intended it to be. Issue number three, Larry Schultz. Yes. Um, a couple of the ones that I had chosen were already taken, <laughs> uh, which is perfectly fine. But I've got one that everyone... Do you want to defer? ...will get fired up about. Here we go. There you go. Will the Senate Judiciary Committee Republicans currently attacking Merrick Garland continue to embarrass themselves and their Ivy League schools uh, as they have thus far or actually prove something by the time the hearings are over? I think that's a loaded question, Larry. (laughs) I do my best. (laughs) Mike Carl isn't even smiling anymore. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Remind me, Merrick Garland is... is the Attorney General. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, and and Ted Cruz was questioning him just one example of this the other day and showed this very, not by now, famous picture of the files scattered on the floor and at Mar-a-Lago with all the secret notations, and he's demanding to know why Merrick Garland's DOJ leaked them. And Merrick Garland says, leaked them? They were attached to a pleading filed in a public court. Now, Ted Cruz is a Harvard Law school graduate, isn't he? I mean, you don't get your facts straight before you go on national television. That's, that's Harvard, yes. 
Are you a Yale guy or a Princeton guy? Yale. Yeah. <laughs> Full disclosure on that one. Go ahead, Mike. But well, I I I, I agree with you that that it's it's a you know, kind of a uh, outrageous behavior on both sides. I really think that that, uh, uh, but but that you know that uh, attack is just you know what you expect and that's a it, but it, but it's not a you know right or wrong i mean it's a, just a political angle situation i think bill yeah uh, i find it unfortunate that individuals that come into a particular office are recognized for their their honesty their objectivity their high esteem they come in take a position such as attorney general and all of a sudden they're being criticized of having no morals whatsoever garland has proved himself uh, proved himself through the years of being a an excellent uh uh excellent fair manager lawyer jurist and the like uh it's uh uh the this deal with uh, uh, the the records are so embedded in politics now. You're going to have to strip off the upper four fifths or nine tenths of any argument to try to get away from the politics. Uh, it's it's just a it's a reflection of where we've come now, especially on the hill, where the objective is not to find the truth. The objective is to embarrass. Chris. Well, I mean, again, I'm going to go back. This is kind of like the bread and circuses. This is something to keep people entertained and engaged, Team R versus Team D, right? You know, you have, uh, whether it's Fox, the Fox News situation or anything else, it's, it's all to keep people, you know, lined up Team R, Team D, and not actually sit down and look at what's actually happening around them. The fact that the government is watching everything you do on your cell phone. The fact that we maintain an empire of 750 military bases in 100 countries worldwide. The fact that we are in debt $92,000 per citizen. The fact that we're involved in so many boondoggles, and we're talking about giving uh, welfare to Ukrainians now. Um, the government has expanded so far and is such a violation of what the founding fathers intended, but they come up to, to keep people entertained and keep them closely in their R&D boxes. You know, you have Ted Cruz attacking on one side and Merrick Garland on the other, and you don't actually stop and say, what is the, the, the role and duty of government as supposed to be in the Constitution? And they're just giving us this bread and circus to keep us entertained. Joe Ferretti. Well, uh, Harvard or not, uh, the three <laughs> words that never have to be uttered to Ted Cruz is dumb it down. Uh, I, I would think that uh, the Republicans have an opportunity here in the next two years for legitimate oversight. And I, for one, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about our withdrawal from Afghanistan. I, I think that was uh, handled poorly, and I, I'd like to know – you know, some of the decision making behind that. Uh, and that, that to me is, would be legitimate oversight. The theater that they want to engage in and, and beat up the attorney general over w w was kind of laughable. And as Larry pointed out, uh, Ted Cruz didn't even know the facts before he was uh, bumbling and bustering, uh, you know, just, just going full bore at Garrick Marlin. It was just embarrassing. So I, I would hope they would seize the moment here because. Their prospects in, in the next presidential election right now are looking pretty dim because uh, there's one man who's leading the pack, and, and, and that's a surefire loss for them. So they, they, they better seize the moment and show that they are able to govern. And, and right now, it, it's, it, that question still remains. Comes back to you, Larry. Um, yeah, all I would say is that there are a number of examples of this, and it is true that congressional hearings – uh, on both sides can take that point but this one seems to have no purpose whatsoever they're not going to get merrick garland uh on any kind of uh true wrongdoing or any kind of terrible and they know it and they're just screaming at him he's a polite guy josh hawley's on there screaming at him uh about uh, armed uh, federal agents attacking Catholics, and I don't know. I don't even know what he's talking about. And it was some kind of um, uh, Fox News like uh, insanity. It sounded like to me, and I, I just don't understand how they think. 
that's going to generate 81 million votes in the next presidential election. I don't, I don't know how they're going to do that. They need to lead with a Hunter Biden and you know, scam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, Mike, that's not getting any traction at all except with a group of Republicans. The, well, the country as a whole ha, has not picked up on that piece of paper. Because the media... Well, Fox is certainly well, trying. Lied, lied to them far tried. worse than Fox ever did about uh, this other thing. Uh, what I what I am waiting to see uh, from the Hunter Biden <laughs> hearings if, is if maybe someone can shed some light on how Jared Kushner got $2 billion from the Saudis when his father-in-law was the president. If, if we could ever find that out, that would be very valuable Hunter Biden material. I would like to look Otherwise. into how all these elected people on a public servant's salary, albeit a six-figure one, retire with estates and homes in various locations and automobiles Amen. that most of us yep. could never even think about driving, yet all they ever did was serve as an elected official. Someone want to answer that question? Not e- Examine not e- it from both parties, maybe. <laughs> not easily, Rob. Right. Trump made his in the private sector. Playing some games for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of there were a lot of bankruptcy claims there, man. He bought a lot of cars with that money he didn't pay to the contractors. <laughs> All right, we take our break here and, and uh, moving in. Uh, Anders, you're on the clock here as we come back. All right, to uh, issue number four, and Mr. Anders, you're on the clock. Okay, I want to talk about uh, the open fields doctrine. Uh, for those that are not familiar, uh, the Supreme Court decided in the Hester case that the Fourth Amendment, which is the requirement to get a warrant, does not apply to anything outside of your house. Okay, it only applies to things inside of your house. Uh, the whole Hester case had to do about prohibition. Again, we all know prohibition doesn't work, but we don't need to talk about that. But uh, what happened recently in West Virginia that will actually, compared to all these other issues, actually impact every property owner here is Delegate Charlie Horst had put in a bill to end the open fields doctrine in, Virgin- in West Virginia. Right. And the uh, House of Delegates uh, ran by Robert uh, Roger Hanshaw had decided that, well, yeah, they they claim to support the Second Amendment. They claim to support the entire Constitution was not going to support your Fourth Amendment right to privacy. What's happening with this is that farmers and hunters are finding trail cameras put up by the government on their property. And if they take them down, they can be arrested. In other words, we have no right to privacy if we're doing anything outside of our house. And I think that, you know, it it is the duty of the legislature to enforce the Constitution. And I believe that the Fourth Amendment protects all of us against, you know, uh, unwarranted search and seizures. And I'm always complaining about the NSA. You know, my question is, why did the legislature, which supposedly is a conservative legislature, uh, punt on trying to stop what I lovingly call the possum cops or the DNR from, uh, you know, just spying on you on your own private property that you bought with the money that you earn uh, without a warrant. All right, let's start first with attorney at law, Joe Ferretti, via telephone. Well, the basic question you pose, Chris, is, uh, and it's always an issue in Fourth Amendment searches and, and seizures, is is the area that is subject to a search, is there a reasonable expectation of privacy? And the courts have long decided that what you do out in the open, whether it's a farmer's field or, or you've got an extended yard beyond your house, that's out in the open, and there, there wouldn't reasonably be an expectation of privacy there because people could see you from the air, uh, planes flying over, uh, you know, people driving by, unless your house is, has a 10-foot fence, they can see what you're doing, and there wouldn't be an expectation of privacy there. And that's often how courts decide whether or not a search is reasonable uh, if it's being challenged. So the open fields doctrine, and you're right, it went back to the era of prohibition to see if uh, the government could find where there were stills out in the woods, and, uh, and lately it's been, you know, trying to uncover people who are cultivating marijuana and other crops that are, uh, in, in many states still illegal to have. So, uh, I, I don't know that, uh, we're ever going to get to the point where, uh, you, uh, we overturn the open field doctrine. I know some states have cut back on it. Some state constitutions actually grant you more protection than, than federal law does and the, and the constitution does. But, uh, there, you know, there's always going to be a question, is there a legitimate state interest in evaluating and seeing what is being done out in the open? And in many cases, in terms of at least criminal activity, there is. 
So that's the balancing that must take place. So I, I don't see a complete abrogation of the open field doctrine, but I can see where West Virginia might try to curtail that a little bit and follow the other states' leads to give you a little bit more protection in what you do on your own property. Larry Schultz. Uh, yeah, and it would be interesting to see to what it would be interesting to know to what extent our legislature <coughs> looked at those other uh, states and how they have uh, chipped away at the open fields doctrine in certain circumstances to see whether, hey, maybe we should do this too. Of course, when you elect legislatures in an election, in, in, in a free election, they're very loath to be thought of as somebody who gave an opening to pot growers or to still uh, people with stills. They're very loath to be um, doing that uh, sort of thing and appear to be uh, protecting that sort of freedom. And uh, there's a difference, as I'm sure Chris uh, well knows, between conservatives and libertarians in that in that regard. And conservatives will always say, at all expense, we're going to protect the family and we're going to protect, um, um, you know, your children from not having the other kid in school selling them the dope that mom and uh, mom and dad grew uh, in hiding on the back lot. Um, and so. The, the, it's not surprising to me that a conservative legislature would do this. That's because they're more interested in re-election than they necessarily are in refining or improving the protections of the federal constitution for the residents of the state. And I, I, I'm guessing that, that if that this never came to a vote because nobody necessarily wanted to be on record. And so it goes to the rules committee, and suddenly it's found to be in violation of these arcane rules. And I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Right. Um, so that it, that's what happens, um, and it do, I don't find it surprising. I have um, long felt, since there were drones, for example, that I don't want somebody flying a drone over my property. And, of course, it's kind of hard to tell from this little white thing buzzing above your house, uh, whether it's your neighbor messing around with his new toy or the sheriff's department. <laughs> and I don't care. I have a feeling that I, uh, I'd have to research this before I did it. But uh, my feeling would be this is a place for my pheasant shotgun. <laughs> and this, we're going to uh, stop these people from spying on us. Look, there are places on my property that are outdoors, but I still consider them private. Mm -hmm. The deck attached to my house, for example, it's got a fence around it you can't see through. If you're below that fence, you can do things that you wouldn't do on a public street. But it ought to be recognized as having some nature of some sort of privacy to it. Um, I, that they can't hover a drone over the top of it and video uh, everything you do on your deck. Um, I, you know, I can see the arguments both ways for this, uh, but I don't think... Well, should I not, as a minimum, as a property owner, at least be notified by the government that they're going to post things on my property? Joe, Larry, Mike? I, I'm not aware uh, and maybe Chris can elaborate on that. I'm not aware of instances where uh, either the state or federal government has come in and posted trail cams on private mm -hmm. property. Chris, yeah. is that they, is there they a have? There's been that? a couple cases in Virginia that's come to light uh, where where literally a a farmer ha found these cameras, didn't know whose they were, took them down, went back to his house, and the police showed up the next day to arrest him for taking down government cameras. And they were on his property. Yes. That's an issue. Mike Carl. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I, I'm uh, surprised that I'm not I'm not surprised that they did this, but, but only in the, in the sense that that has killed the bill, that they haven't killed a lot of other ridiculous uh, social behavior bills that are wasting the time. The, 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 the mandate and the duty of the legislature is is to promote the efficiency of government, the effectiveness of government, and, and, and to promote the economy of West Virginia. And 
that's the bill I want to talk about when we go next. But but uh, I don't uh, uh, to 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 go crazy to defend the rights of the only people who who's who need this right are people doing something wrong. I'm not I'm not concerned about the killing the bill at all. Mr. Andrews, fine. Oh, good, Bill. Yeah. And it may have been they just run out of time as well. We don't know what the, what the reason is to not go forward. Uh, I do have a technical question. Since this is based upon Supreme Court ruling, does it take a constitutional amendment on the part of a state, as Joe inferred earlier, or can it done, be done by statute? It can be done by statute. By and statute. the thing is, you know, I, I'm reading the Fourth Amendment, and nowhere in the Fourth Amendment does it say the word privacy. It just says that they are required to get a warrant supported by oath or affirmation and describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized, okay? Um, and it has nothing to do with whether you're a, uh, a, a libertarian or a Republican, which I'm a Republican, or, or a Democrat. It has to do with, um, you know, when you take an oath of office, you're taking an oath to the Constitution, Right. And it's not the job of government to create jobs. It is not the jo- government, you know, the, the politicians run an effective government. It's a job of politicians to protect our God-given inherent rights that we inherited the day we were born or we were conceived, in my opinion. So, you know, the, the government, again, is involving itself in way too much. And we had an opportunity here to actually protect the property owners uh, of West Virginia, and, and they just punted on it. Issue number five goes to Mike Carl. Uh, want to real quick go and, and we had an earlier clip of uh, Senate President uh, Blair, Blair uh, talking about the, the latest development in the income tax. But it, and it's and, and as he pointed out, it's not just limited to income tax relief now. And and the the the, the, the Senate version that they you know glommed onto the the House bill that came over. Uh, did a lot of a, a lot of that, and it it, it one of the more uh, uh, careful things it did. It, it it has a you know a one year across the board rate reduction, but then it has a wait and see approach to future ones based on sales tax revenues and so forth. But and, but and it all but it also gives uh, income tax relief in you know to, for payment of personal property taxes, not just by individuals on their vehicles, but by businesses, uh, including some businesses that, you know, are set up to pay the corporate corporation income tax. So, and, and so I, I, you know, it, it moved very close to, or a lot closer to what I was hoping for. And I was holding my breath, but I, I was very pleased to see, to hear the governor was very positive about, about that, you know, bill, and, and hopefully that'll mean that the the house will you know accept the changes, and and we'll 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 have all that done, and that, and that'll be a good start on tax relief. But I I'm interested in everybody else's thoughts on those issues. All right, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, they deserve credit. They've come a long way, and they've worked together. So I give them credit. There are certain things, as Ken Apple would say. A, an omission, the marriage penalty. I heard an exp- explanation the other day of why they did not not address the marriage penalty. Uh, I felt that was not really an adequate explanation. This is something basic, something that uh, affected a lot of people in the state, and so I think that's a major omission on the part of the uh, of the Senate and the and the House. Larry Schultz, um, these are interesting um, developments. Um, I'm a taxpayer. I don't mind having my taxes cut, but I need to see my government in the state doing the things that they already have set out for many years to do that are not being done very well now. And usually to improve your performance as a government in an executive uh, uh, capacity, you need more money, not less. And so it makes me nervous for such issues as child care. Uh, child welfare, um, uh, foster care, uh, teacher pay, uh, and some of the other things. But they've assured us that there's no problem with that, and so we're going to see. Um, well, their pay raise is pretty broad in, in, in other 
Related to legislation. Yeah, except with the teachers and some of the others, the PEIA increase is going to take the pay raise away. That pay raise, they should have just given the money to PEIA and saved everybody a lot of pay. Oh, you mean they, what, they're raising their... Their, their premiums? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sub- substantially, yeah. <laughs> Joe Ferretti. Well, I, as an aside, I, I'll, I'll point out that... Uh, the governor got right with the legislature as soon as the Senate made noises about investigating that money going to, to Marshall's baseball. That's people. right. It comes back <laughs> to you, doesn't it, Joe? <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's your theory. Uh, but let me tell you, I, I think that um, uh, Larry points out something that's important here. Yeah, I, I like a tax cut, too. And I think we, we deserve one. And I think the money is there to some extent to do it. But there are so many competing interests for state revenues and my only dismay here is the, the lack of committee hearings, uh, public hearings, where there's testimony taken from experts and from the stakeholders that, that get state money so that uh, we could be assured that the legislature is taking all these competing interests into account. I don't see these hearings taking place. A lot of this is behind closed doors. Uh, they'll get something done. I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful it will be um, beneficial for all, but I, I just – and have been disappointed that we don't hear and see more about the process. Mr. Anders. Well, I think we have to go back to the point and realize that we live in a republic that was uh, that we rebelled against a government that gave us a 2% tax on a breakfast beverage that was not coffee, right? Um, you know, the Tax Act. Uh, Act. Um, we've gotten to the point where you remember during the presidential debates when Romney uh, was the uh, – the candidate, and they, they talked to him, you know, he, they called him on a hot mic moment. And they said, well, you know, 49% of people don't pay any income taxes. And all I kept thinking is, that's a good start, okay? <laughs> when it comes down to it, you know, uh, it, I know they've come some distance. I will give them credit for doing that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, all these little idiosyncrasies just, you know, strikes me just how, you know, insane our tax code is. Um, and we do need to reduce it. We do need to reduce the taxes. In fact, I'd be really happy with zero income tax and zero property tax. Because if we cook, again, the government, put it in its constitutional box, what should it be doing? We wouldn't need to take money from the taxpayers. At all? That's it. Not a penny? Not a penny. Not a penny. All right. Uh, back to you, Mike Carl. Well, uh, one of the things is, uh, and I, you know, I, pretty much agree with what I've heard here, but but uh, you get the right tax system, and I agree that we, we, should, we should ultimately get rid of all income tax because it's the wrong tax system. But if, if you have the right tax system and you lower the rates, you raise the revenue because we're competing with, you know, 49 other states and we're going to draw the producers – and the taxpayers from those other states, and and that and we we're we're slow getting to that competitive level, but this is a good start in that, in that direction. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on something that uh, Joe Ferretti said a while ago, uh, and that's the lack of transparency, the lack of hearings. If there's some way you want to push the red button of our legislators, and both the, especially the Senate, but also on the House side, that that they're not showing sufficient transparency, they will go to battle stations very quick from their perception. From my perception is they have not shown the transparency. They've had very few hearings. They've had very few hearings of bringing professionals in uh, to look at an issue and a broad array of issues. Uh, So even though they tell us that, trust us, we're showing, we're, we're having the hearings, we're going through the transparency, paint me as one that is a doubter because I've not seen it. Chris, uh, you know, the thing about public hearings, um, is there just more political theater? Most of the politicians understand how they're going to vote going into that hearing. We often see the videos of them actually sleeping through the hearings, of them playing, you know, solitaire on their computers. Um, public hearing is just more theater. They've already made up their mind how they're going to vote before the hearing even happens. So while it's cute, it makes it feel like we're involved, they've already made up their mind. Unfortunately, you're probably right. But that in no way excuses the fact we do not should not have public hearings or more professionals coming in. Well, you know, and that's that's different than public hearing. Gentlemen, having get your final thoughts together. You've got eight seconds apiece. Don't waste a single second of them. 